Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is our January Astronomy Fundamentals meeting. Um, if you have any questions during this meeting, uh, there's two ways to post them. If you're watching on Facebook, you can just post in the comment section uh, on this video. Or if you're watching on our website, or if you don't want to post in the comment section, you can email questions at neighboraster.org. And those will go to Chris in the control room, and he will feed those to our speaker tonight. And hopefully they can uh, answer, answer these questions live. Uh, so tonight, our speaker is Linda Thomas Fowler. Uh, she is, uh, I think, a lifelong, uh, has a lifelong love of, of the sky and space. And she's been, uh, for about the last 20 plus years, uh, been an amateur astronomer. And she is going to talk to us tonight about all sky cameras. So Linda, if you're there, I will turn it over to you. If you want to share your screen. Thanks, Jim. So you have the, uh, the full screen version of that now? Yes, we do. OK. So we're going to be talking about all sky cameras. And so the first basic question is, what's an all sky camera? And the idea is, you're going to use it to take images of the entire, or at least most of the sky periodically during the night and, and possibly during the day as well. Essentially, it's the combination of a digital camera along with some software. And you might, in addition to taking these pictures, use it to do some other things like time-lapse videos, keygrams, and star trails. And we'll talk about all of those things as we go. Um, why do you want one? Well, they're, they're, if you're an imager, they're great for keeping tabs on what the sky is doing while you're indoors. And you can also use them for looking for meteors, keeping an idea of how much air traffic's going overhead, seeing how light pollution changes, all sorts of possibilities. And I'm sure I haven't thought of all the possible reasons you might want one. And they're just fun. So this is an example of what you might see through an all-sky camera. And this is a time-lapse video taken from back in late summer here at my location. And you can see the summer Milky Way going through. You can see airplanes zipping through. And of course, we've got clouds making their way through as well. And uh, you can see you get a, a pretty good view of what the night sky looks like and a pretty good idea of what your current sky conditions are. This wouldn't have been a great night for imaging, but there were a couple of hours in there where the sky was reasonably clear. And, uh, you know, by, and my uh, spouse woke up and turned on the kitchen light there. <laughs> um, and dawn has come upon us. So that's, that's kind of one basic example of what you get out of an all sky camera. So where can you get one of these things? There are commercial products, but they're amazingly expensive. And they have the limitation of using an older CCD style sensor. And so that means they generally won't work for daytime exposures. But building one of these things is actually not that hard. I'm going to say it a couple of times. If I can build it, anybody can. And really, if I can build it, anyone can. They're not that difficult with some basic skills. You can do it. And the cost can be anywhere from a third to two thirds of that of a commercial product. So what do you need to be able to do to make one of these things? You need to be able to drill some holes to apply silicone sealer, uh, to assemble a Raspberry Pi and install its operating system, and to be able to install and configure the AllSky All software. And then the one thing that I can't really tell you exactly how to do because it's going to depend on your circumstances is to figure out how you're actually going to mount the all sky camera in its final location. So these are the things that you're going to need a ZWO camera, a Raspberry Pi. I used a Raspberry Pi 4, but you can use a, a, an older Pi. A lens, the ZWO camera will come with an all sky lens. Um, but you might want to get a, a wider field lens. You're going to need a housing to put it all in, an acrylic dome, uh, two and a half inch is the smallest you can go with, uh, but a three inch probably makes more sense. 
You're going to need to get power into that box. You're going to need some kind of mounting bracket. You might need a network cable if you're not going to use Wi-Fi. And you're going to need one or two cable glands, depending on how many cables you're getting into that box. We'll get into what cable glands are in a bit. And uh, I recommend a small piece of dark fabric to actually cover up everything in the camera but the lens. Um, you'll need a drill and some silicone sealer and then the all sky camera software package. So you're going to need to make some holes in this nice shiny new housing that you bought. And you're gonna need at least two and maybe three holes. You're gonna need a larger two inch hole to put the, uh, that the camera's going to look through for the dome. You, you might actually be able to make a smaller hole but um, depending on the all sky camera lens that you use, it might be easier to make a, a larger hole. Uh, if you're gonna be powering the, uh, the um, Raspberry Pi um, with a normal 120 volt power supply, then you're gonna need to bring that power up into the housing. Uh, if you're gonna use ethernet, you need to bring that into the housing. Um, Although you have the option of doing power over ethernet, which couldn't eliminate one of those cables for you. Now you have to figure out how you're gonna mount the camera uh, inside the housing. In my case, I just used a small piece of wood with four bolts and then a fifth bolt that actually goes up through the center there into the camera. And uh, that gets placed inside the housing. Exactly how you'll do this will depend on what kind of housing you're using. And you're gonna need the Raspberry Pi. This is a Pi 4. Um, you can get a, a basic bare bones Pi with some heat sinks, or you can get kits that include cables and keyboards and other things like that. You don't necessarily need those. Um, you're gonna need a minimum of a 16 gigabyte SD card, but probably 128 gigabyte is a better choice, especially if you wanna store any historical data on the Pi. Uh, there's a, a YouTube uh, channel called Patriot Ask Astro that has a really good video on how to set up the Pi. I'm not gonna cover that in this video. It would take too long and, and probably put everybody to sleep trying to, to watch all that. But if you search for Patriot Astro All Sky Camera Part One, that'll get you to, the, uh, to his set of videos. So you're going to need a ZWO camera. The AllSky camera actually will use with the work with the Raspberry Pi camera, but the ZWO camera will give you a better picture. So the absolute cheapest route for ZWO is the ASI 120MC, but you can get some, uh, some better pictures with some other cameras. The 178MC uh, will give you a complete 360 degree image circle, or at least has capability with a, a different lens. I'm using the 300 or the 385 MC that has almost a 360 degree image circle and it has really good sensitivity. And uh, the AllSky camera even supports cooled cameras, but as far as I know, most people are using uncooled cameras. So you'll also need a lens. Now ZWO ships their cameras with an all sky camera lens that'll work. At least they, they ship their, their cameras like the 178 and the 385 with those sorts of lenses. Uh, that lens will not give you a full 360 degree view. So I picked up this star dot lens, which gives you a slightly wider field of view. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like this lens is available any longer, and I haven't been able to find a good replacement. But um, if you look for a, a 1.5 millimeter lens, uh, a CS mount, then that should be the equivalent of what I have here. Um, but the problem is I can't find one anywhere. So you need to put all of this in the housing. So it's going to hold the Pi and the camera and possibly any power uh, that you need. A lot of people use PVC pipes and end caps. Uh, I use this square box and I actually built an earlier version of this in the summer that had a whole bunch of stuff other than the pie 
and the camera inside of there. So it was a much larger box. And unfortunately, um, at the end of October, we had a major windstorm. And uh, I thought I had things secured well, and turned out I didn't. It cracked the housing. So I decided to separate the stuff that was in the top uh, to just the minimum and then put other equipment down at the bottom. So I split things up into two boxes. So now I have this much smaller box. So the dome is how your camera is going to see the sky. I used a three inch dome. Uh, you can get away with a 2.5 inch, but I, I don't think I'd go any smaller than that. And of course you can use a larger dome if your housing will support it. So once you have this, you know, you've got to get power in there. In my case, I added a PoE hat, a power over ethernet hat that attaches to the Raspberry Pi and it allows it to be powered over ethernet. So I only have one cable coming into the box and that cable is handling both data and power. And then inside the box, there's the USB cable that's going to go to the camera. So I mentioned cable glands, oops. Um, cable glands allow you to pass a cable into the housing while still keeping it sealed. And they have a side effect of also giving you some strain relief for the cable. Um, you can actually find them large enough to pass an ethernet jack through, uh, but they're not gonna be large enough to pass the power cord or the plug for 120 power cord. So in that case, you'd need to cut the cord and then attach a replacement cord uh, plug on the end once it's through, or socket actually in this case. Um, in my case, I actually used a smaller cable gland and then just crimped an RJ45 on the end of it. So um, you can do it either way. I just, I wanted to use the smallest cable gland I could get away with. And so that's why I opted to actually install the RJ45 once the cable was inside the box. So then you have to mount the stuff inside the housing. Now, the housing I picked was actually very tight, maybe a little bit too tight. Um, I couldn't actually fit the Raspberry Pi with the case that would hold the power over Ethernet hat. Uh, it would hold a normal Raspberry Pi case, but not the larger case needed to accommodate the PoE hat. So I ended up having to ditch the case entirely, leave the Pi naked. And so I have. I actually, it's not in this picture, but I put a piece of plastic under the pie uh, just to make sure that nothing on the pie could touch a little bit of metal that's in the uh, bottom of that case to provide some mounting points that I'm not actually using. So in my case, there's a small piece of plastic, the pie, and then the little mounting harness for the camera. And I just wrapped the bolts on the, uh, on the uh, that are holding up the camera with some tape to insulate them from the pie. There you can see how the cable's coming into the pie. And you can also see my really, really expert application of silicone sealer. I'm not the world's neatest builder. The one thing that you might not see in other build recipes that I found really useful is to take a piece of black fabric, cut a hole in the center of it and put it over top of your camera. Um, unless your hole is really tiny that the lens is sticking through, you're gonna find that that red finish on the ZWO cameras is very, very reflective. And so the sun or a full moon will shine in off the camera or shine in, bounce off the camera, come off the, the dome and then back into your lens and create an ugly reflection in your picture. But if you put this in, it'll eliminate those reflections you may still get a little bit of reflection from the lens. But it also has the side effect of keeping a little bit of sun off the camera and so keeping your camera cooler, which helps in the summer. So now you have to figure out once you have that housing built, how are you going to mount it? In my case, I'm using a portable mast that was intended for a radio antenna. And so I got this uh, bracket that um, uses hose clamps to attach to the mount. And then I just screwed through the, uh, through the bracket into a piece of wood. And then I use Velcro to secure the case 
the housing to that block of wood. So here's how it looks all together. This was actually taken today. Um, just, uh, just actually got things reassembled today. And so the, uh, the thing on the right is the all sky camera. The thing on the left is actually a sky quality meter. And uh, there's the one cable coming out. And this is the uh, temporary mast that's holding things up. This picture was from back in the summer. And you can see here, uh, this is the older housing. So it's a, a much larger box. And uh, you can see how, the, uh, how things were secured up there. It was the same bracket, but uh, this turned out to have a lot more wind load. And even though I thought I had this mast secured against wind, that proved not to be the case. So you're also going to need some software. And the software that I used is Thomas Jackwin's All Sky Software Package. And here's the URL for where you can get that. If you go to github.com and search for Thomas Jackwin All Sky, you'll find it. Uh, so this, this software takes images periodically during the day or night and displays them for you. It automatically saves them to disk and optionally it can save the daytime images as well. At the end of the night, it can produce the time-lapse video, the keygram and the star trail image. And it can also upload those images to another server for long-term storage. So I mentioned keygrams a couple of times. So what this is, is you take an image, uh, each image from the night, you take a slice right down the center of that image, and then you stitch those slices together. And what you get is a view of the night from the beginning of the night on the left to dawn on the right. And you see how, at least at the zenith through the, through the meridian, um, your sky looked over the course of the night. So you can see on this picture, it was cloudy at the beginning of the night and then it cleared up and then the moon came up. So it gives you a really nice overview of how the sky behaved over the course of a night. Obviously it's an after the fact thing. You don't get a kiogram until you've got the whole night's images. You can also take all of the images from the night and stack them together. And this gives you star trails. And um, you can see, in addition to, uh, to the stars, you can see airplanes come through. You might see some bright meteors, uh, probably not anything that's, that's not exceptionally bright in terms of a meteor, but you, you do have that possibility. And again, it gives you an overview of the night. So we mentioned time-lapse videos earlier. Um, this is basically taking each image for the night and putting them together as a time-lapse video. And another, again, it's a good way to see what happened during the course of the night. Those flashes you're seeing at the bottom of the screen are from cars driving by and illuminating the tree on our property. Um, so you can see things were pretty cloudy here in the beginning of the night, but then miraculously it almost cleared up and then we're back into the clouds again. One of the cool things about the All Sky camera is it actually makes the clouds almost tolerable. It does make them interesting. That um, you can see how things were behaving over the course of the night. And you can get a really good qualitative assessment of what your sky was like just by looking at that video. So the All, All Sky camera or software can also be extended. In my case, um, I wanted to get a reading from my sky quality meter in there. You can see where it says SQM 20.7 magnitudes per square arc second. That's a piece of data that's coming from my All Sky camera. And I just wrote a little script to grab that information, format it into a file, and then the All Sky camera software reads that file and displays it. I'm also grabbing some weather information off of the internet 
and putting that in there as well. So the first three lines are what's provided by the All Sky camera software. And then, or the first four lines rather, uh, the last three lines are what's coming from the extension that I wrote. And that's extension is not part of the All Sky camera software. It's just a little Linux script that grabs this information and formats a text file, which the software then knows how to read. And then there is the question of remote controlling power, which depending on where your All Sky camera is, uh, it might be awkward to go reboot your Pi if it crashes for some reason. So in my case now, I'm using a power over Ethernet switch. So I can go to the switch and disable and then re-enable power to reboot the Pi. Um, but if you're using a regular 120 volt power switch, then you can use something like these CASA uh, remote power switches, which can be controlled through a, a web app and or through a phone app. And they can uh, you know, turn the power off to your Pi, turn the power back on to your Pi if you need to. So what were my concerns with this? Well, one concern if you're going to build one of these things is make sure it doesn't leak. You know, put everything together, then leave it empty and submerge it or spray a hose on it or take it in the bathtub. Do what you need to do to make sure it's not going to leak because you don't want it to fill up with water in your first rainstorm. And I first built mine in the summer and I was really concerned about heat. Um, and the new smaller housing actually seems to retain more heat than my older, larger housing. So I've ordered a couple of IP67 air and moisture vents, which actually attach to the housing just like a cable gland. You just drill a hole in the side and put them in. They claim that these things will let air out, but not let water in. And uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, they should arrive tomorrow. So I'm hoping that will actually help me get some of the heat out, out of the case. Um, the camera is going to be exposed to the sun, you know, eight to 12 hours a day. And how is it gonna hold up? So far, mine's held up fine. Um, and will do be a problem? And in my case, no, there seems to be enough heat between the Raspberry Pi and the camera generated to keep things from doing up. And then how long is it gonna to take to melt snow off the dome? Well, I just got mine back in the air, so I missed the first snowstorm, but we might be getting more in, in a couple of days. So I'll hopefully find out soon. Um, but if I'm interrupt, uh, we have a few sure. questions kind of going along with what you were talking about, there was concerns. Sure. Uh, one person asks, uh, with that black fabric, uh, does it, have you noticed if it started fading yet or is it too new still? Um, from the first camera, it actually did start to fade fairly quickly. Yeah, I, it was up there for about uh, three or four months and before it, the wind knocked it over and it did start to fade. So um, we'll see what happens. I use different fabric this time, um, but, you know, I, I, I do expect it to fade again. I, I might need to see if I can find some fabric that's uh, better. Uh, um, protected against sun fading, but yeah, definitely a concern. Okay, and then another question, uh, I'll just kind of ask, ask them as they have come in. Uh, do you see part of the mast in the way that you have it mounted currently? In the way that I currently have it mounted, yes. In the way I had it mounted before, no. But when I'm finished, I've, I've got to pull it down to put those vents in. When I remount it, I'll mount it closer to the top of the mast so that it's not visible. Okay, and that kind of leads into, I'm going to go a little bit out of order. Another individual asked, uh, uh, why do you choose to put the holes on the side of the housing versus the bottom of the house? In, in my case, because I had a, a block of wood that the uh, uh, thing was going to sit on, I figured it was easier to do it that way. Um, I could have drilled a hole in the wood and brought things out the bottom that way, but um, I, I was tired of drilling holes at that point, so I opted to go the easier route. <laughs> Okay, and uh, so this one's kind of maybe should have held for the end here, but uh, have you caught anything really cool when you review the footage, anything that jumps out? 
We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, I thought that might be the case. All right. So far, I don't see any others right now. Okay. So there, um, you know, no, no software is perfect. Um, the first one, and, and I don't know, the first one might not still be an issue. I was off, uh, my camera was offline for a couple of months. So it's possible this has been fixed and, and maybe Eric can chime in with this because he's one of the contributors to the software. But um, on the time-lapse videos, the uh, exposures with a bright moon would pulse. That didn't happen when there wasn't a bright moon. It doesn't affect the, you're viewing the images real time as they come in, you don't notice it. But when you put together the time-lapse video, you would see it pulse, not a big deal. Uh, but just something to be aware of, and it could be gone by now. Um, the software update process is entirely manual. It can be a little bit confusing the first time you do it, um, but it's not hard. It's just, you know, you've got to follow the steps that, that are provided um, and definitely make a copy of your directory before you do this so that if you do mess anything up, you can get back to where you started from. And it does require some basic familiarity with Raspberry Pis and Linux. It doesn't require a lot. The instructions basically guide you through everything, but the more comfortable you are with those things, the easier you're going to find it. And full disclosure, I'm a software geek, so that wasn't a concern for me. I'm, it's, it's more scary to put a tool in my hand than to put, you know, a software in my hand. So that part I was comfortable with. It was the the tool part that's the scary part for me. I, I do have a few other comments, just more like sure. comments than questions. Uh, and I believe Eric's made these, but I'm not sure. Uh, it says the All Sky Facebook group is a good source for information. So I think that kind of lends to what you were just talking. And they suggested the Raspberry Pi camera uh, is about $80 cheaper than the Zwoll. So also. Shop yeah, around, apparently, is what yeah the, the Raspberry Pi camera is definitely cheaper. It was my I haven't used one, so I, I can't speak to its quality. But my understanding was that it didn't produce as good of images. But maybe they've they've gotten better with dealing with that by now. So I, I can't speak to that. And uh, that might be something that Eric might have some knowledge of as well. Mm -hmm. So in terms of cost, if you were to buy a commercial camera, it would be around a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. And that would be just the camera and its housing. You'd still have to provide some sort of computer to deal with it. And likely that would need to be a Windows computer. So in my case, uh, my total cost for the, uh, for the first version I built was about $650. Um, you could do it cheaper. Um, uh, the biggest chunk of that cost is the camera. So if you opt for the Raspberry Pi camera or a cheaper ZWO camera, uh, you can bring the cost down, but you can do it. But that, that total cost includes the camera, the housing and the computer that runs it. Um, so compared to a commercial product, it's even if you're going the more expensive route, it's still half of what, what a commercial product would cost you. Uh, before you before you move on, <laughs> we did have another question posed. Uh, sure. What's, what sort of magnitude limit are you getting on this camera? Could these cameras be used to record satellite passes? I haven't noticed any satellites in mind, so it's probably um, probably not something you can practically do. Um, Airplanes I get all the time, but I haven't noticed any satellites and I hadn't noticed any meteors. Um, I don't know what the actual magnitude limit is. My camera is fairly sensitive. I'm running it at gain 200 and doing 20 second exposures or up to 20 second exposures. Um, and so when the moon's out, it's going to shorten the exposure because it doesn't need to be as bright. So your limiting ma magnitude is going to be um, lower, but uh, without a full moon, you can probably get reasonably dim, but I, I can't give you an estimate in terms of actual magnitude. 
Okay, and I do have, uh, I think you kind of already answered these, but uh, one is, uh, I don't see heater for the dome. Do you get frost? I think you mentioned that it does keep it warm enough. And then a uh, second question also, I think you kind of answered, can you use a laptop rather than a Raspberry Pi? With this software, uh, this particular software that I'm using was intended for a Raspberry Pi. It should run on any kind of Linux distribution. So you could use a laptop that was running Linux. If you wanted to do Windows, there is a commercial all sky camera software package. I'm not familiar with it, uh, but it does exist. I think the cost is maybe around 50 to $60. Um, so yes, it's possible, but not with this package, not under Windows anyway. Oh, and I have another couple here. Uh, first of all, someone mentioned Raspberry Pi images are pretty good now. But then uh, using, I'm not sure, I'm not up to speed on this one, but using PoE would need a router with PoE support. So I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, if you're using power over ethernet, um, you need to have one of two things. You need to have a, a power over ethernet switch, which was what I'm using in my case or you need to have a power over ethernet injector, which puts power in after the switch. And then, um, you know, the Pi gets it that way. So it, it can be done one of two ways, but in, in my case, I'm using a power over ethernet switch. But yes, you, you do need to have one of those two things if you're gonna do power over ethernet. That's all I have for now. Okay. So this was uh, actually almost the first day that I put my original housing up there. This bird decided it was a great place to perch and he hung out there for a little while. Um, never saw him again though. Um, we've had flies up there. I actually, had a spider and I don't know how it got in to, to this day. I've not been able to figure out how a spider found its way into um, the housing and it liked to sit. I originally, I thought it was sitting on top of the dome, but it was sitting uh, on the lens and it liked to go up there at night and kind of glare at the moon. Uh, and then during the day, it would come back down off that. Uh, so I, I thought I had a picture of him, but I couldn't find it for this presentation. But it, it, it looked enormous because I thought it was on the dome. So I thought it was like a three inch spider and it turned out to be like a little quarter inch spider, but it looked pretty terrifying when it was large up there on the camera lens. And then uh, weather can become an interesting thing to see when, uh, when you've got one of these things up. We got all sorts of light show from from thunderstorms in the summer. This was a, a good test of just how waterproof the housing was. I have a, my own question. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you, do you, initiate the recordings or do you have it on some kind of a scheduler that automatically starts recording or yeah. in other words, like for that lightning storm did you suddenly decide to start recording or um I, i'll i'll be able to talk to that a little in a little more detail um and in just a couple of minutes we'll actually look at the software live so the one of the other interesting things that you can do is you can get a qualitative assessment of what your sky quality is like this was in September when the smoke from the fires out west was in our skies here on the East Coast. And you can see, um, particularly around the horizons, just how hazy it looks. And this was all from the, the uh, smoke out there. And you can see the moon's coming up here. And you can just see the sky does not look very good. And uh, so, the, the all sky camera is great at looking at that. You can see all the airplanes going by. This must be a 
pretty common air traffic route that goes across the uh, midpoint of the, screen, the bottom third of the screen there. We get a great view of the summer Milky Way. It's cleared up, but you can still see how hazy it is. And you can get a great sense of the way your clouds move. Um, in my case, they often come up from the south, but sometimes you get clouds moving at two different layers and it actually turns out to be really interesting to review each night's video. So there'll be an article on my website about this. Um, uh, if you just remember Linda's Astronomy Adventures.space, it'll be the, uh, the first article up there after this, but, um, or if you search for all sky camera there, you'll also find it. And then finding me in general, you can find me at lindasastronomyadventures.space or on YouTube if you search for Linda's Astronomy Adventures. And um, on Astrobin, my user ID is AC4LT for my images. So let me bring the software over here. And this is a live view of, of the software. You're seeing that now? Uh, no, we're still seeing the gout. Oh, all right. Let me put that over here. Yeah, no, uh, it. Okay. So this is a live view of the software. Um, you can see we've got a nearly full moon here, making it look like daytime. Um, and uh, we're currently, you know, the last exposure was at 19.2 seconds. And the sky quality meter says the moon is making the sky very, very bright. And it's uh, coming from the net. It's 30 degrees Fahrenheit and there's not much wind. Um, and you can see that how things look now. My, my mast right now is set very low, so we're getting the house. Um, I'm actually going to move this out behind the detached garage, uh, hopefully next week. So um, that'll shield me better from cars on the street, which we still get down here in the, in the corner. But you asked some questions about settings. Let me turn off the advanced options here for the moment. So here's the, the kind of things that you can control. During the day, it's taking an exposure every 30 seconds for me. I think by default, it, it defaults to every five seconds. Um, but I was trying to uh, keep things a little bit cooler in the summer and figured I didn't need a picture every five seconds during the day, every 30 seconds was sufficient. And uh, that helped a little bit. So there you have uh, nighttime settings. You can use a fixed exposure or an auto exposure. In my case, my maximum auto exposure is 20 seconds or 20,000 milliseconds. Um, the manual ex exposure or the uh, nighttime starting exposure is 10 seconds. Uh, the brightness, which is a setting for kind of linearly scaling things up or down, is, is 50 default. You probably want to change that. And then here's the delay between images, which is just 10 milliseconds, because we, um, I want it to basically be taking a picture all the time. Um, during the day, it's automatically using gain zero, but at night, I tell it to use gain 200. Um, you can set that to whatever you want for your camera. And if you want it to bin, you can choose whatever the camera supports. In my case, I'm just doing one by one. Um, you can shrink the image here. You can set the gamma. This is default. You can do an auto white balance. Again, I'm just using uh, a fixed white balance, which is the default. You can flip the image if you want. Um, and then you can tell it to display the time. Um, you can set your time format here. If you want it to show 
the sensor temperature, you can have it do that. And you can have whatever units you want there for that. Uh, in my, my case, um, just having gotten this back online, I told it to show what exposure it was using because I wanted to see what was going on. I wanted to show the gain. I'm not changing the brightness, so I don't need to show that. You can put a fixed text overlay here. And in addition, maybe you want to put a title image on a title text up there. And then here's where I'm getting that extra text from. So I write this file called sqm.txt um, in that script, and this software picks it up. And by default, this is set to 600, which says how long, how many seconds that text sticks around and then disappears. In my case, I don't want it to disappear. So I set that to zero. Um, this lets you adjust the line spacing and font and the color of the fonts. Um, and then there's some other settings here. This notification images puts up some images about the software is starting up or not running and that sort of thing so that you can tell what it's doing. If you have a cooled camera, you can turn the cooler and set the target temperature. And then one setting that you need to definitely update is your latitude and longitude so it knows when day and night should start at your location. And then this angle says at what sun angle above or below the horizon should we start transitioning from day mode to night mode. So in this case, at with the sun six degrees below the horizon, we transition into night mode. And the software can optionally take dark frames that it then uses to do dark subtraction. Um, to do those, you turn this on and cover up the camera, and it'll sit there happily taking dark frames and in, at different temperatures until you tell it to stop. And then you can set your locale here. This is probably the default value. I don't think I changed that. There are some advanced options. Um, that you will probably never need to touch, but they are there if you want them. Um, and uh, like I said, I just got this going again, so there's nothing here to see yet, but this is where you would see your historical data. You'd see the images the uh, time lapse and the keygram and the star trails photos. Unfortunately, I don't have any there yet to show you. You can customize some more settings in here. Uh, this shows you information about your LAN. Uh, this shows you information about your Wi-Fi. Uh, the software is even uh, kind enough to allow you to configure, configure your Wi-Fi here. Um, being the admin control, this is uh, its password protected. So you can set the name of the user ID and the password here. And you can say, uh, see some information about what's going on in your Raspberry Pi here. The most important thing of which is the CPU temperature. If that gets too hot, your Raspberry Pi might get unhappy. And you can stop and start the AllSky software that's running behind the scenes taking the pictures. And you can reboot or shut down the Raspberry Pi. Now, in my case, I also have the pictures being sent over to my NAS, where there is some software, a website that, that uh, shows them. Um, there's also a website a public facing website that can be associated with this software. You can either run it on your Pi, or in my case, I'm running it on my NAS. Uh, I haven't updated this yet, so this is still what it was in the summer. I don't know if they've updated since then, but, um, and this might have some old historical data on it. So you can get to your, your old time lapse.
you can get to your keygram so you can see this was a very cloudy night. A lot of very cloudy nights. <laughs> and uh, here we have one where it's a little bit mostly clear early in the night and then clouds up. So these, like I said, are really useful for seeing the night at a glance. And you've got your, your star trail images. These tend to not look very good when the moon is out. But when you have oh, that one, that one's not very good. Yeah, that one's cloudy. So um, you've got all sorts of stuff there. There's one that's a little bit better. And you can see it just takes the images from the night and stacks them all up. So any text you have gets just written on top of itself over and over and over. Uh, so overall, I, I think these things are great. As if you're an imager, they can take a lot of uh, angst about, is it clouding up on me? Is it going to rain out of the equation? Uh, do I need to go cover the telescope? Um, because you can just look at this and not have to worry about sticking your head outside and keep an eye on what's going on. So that's what my primary use is, but there are, there are a lot of other potential uses for them. Other than that, they're just fun. It was fun, fun project to build and get running. Um, and uh, I'll, I can show one other thing. I forgot to put this in the actual presentation and the, the comment about um, the uh, power over ethernet switch reminded me. So in my case, I have this weatherproof box down at the bottom and you can see it has three cables coming out of it. This is the main power. And then there's two ethernet cables coming out of it. And inside that box, I have the power over ethernet switch, a mesh Wi-Fi node, and then a, a power adapter. And uh, so that's what's going on for me. So what you'd have, if you're in an observatory, you're probably just running um, the ethernet cable inside to a, to a PoE switch that's in your observatory. Uh, that would be the easiest thing to do. Um, if you have it attached to a shed or a house, you know, you might need to do something else. Uh, in my case, it's gonna be behind a garage. And while there's power there, there's no network there. And it's too far from the house to rely on the Pi's Wi-Fi to connect to the house. So the mesh node will get it there reliably in my case. So that's pretty much what I had to, to show and tell. Um, Eric, I don't know if there's anything that you wanna add that I didn't cover that you think might be useful or if there are any additional questions. No, oh, Linda, you did a good job covering there. This is Eric. Yeah, and at this time, Linda, I am not seeing any other questions. There's been a pretty uh, active discussion about what you're showing right now, the power of use in that uh, router stuff. So I think we've addressed most issues. Okay, and great. Well, thank you very much, Linda. Ed, Jim, are you coming back on for a moment? Yes, I'll come back on. I'll take uh, share my screen. And, okay, so uh, this just cropped up today, but uh, Steve Sagarian in the in the club, he's the club librarian currently. He was wanting to see if there was any interest in uh, in the club trying to build members build their own uh, all sky cameras so if if you're watching this if you're interested in it in doing like a zoom uh, zoom call or maybe a couple of different zoom calls to to build these and configure these uh, we set up an email address if you email all sky camera at naperastro.org that'll go to Steve and uh, I don't know how many people uh, Steve needs to to feel like it's 
um, you know, it's worth doing if there's only maybe one person that wants to do it, he might just call you one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, if there's several people interested, I think he'll try to coordinate it a little bit better through the through the Zoom uh, through Zoom meeting. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Very good, very good uh, talk. I might I might actually <laughs> try to build one of these things. So. Thank you, everybody. You have a nice, uh, nice evening, and uh, uh, we'll see you at our next uh, meeting.